Before we start today's episode, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our latest Patreon supporter, Christy Drew, to say thank you for helping to support the show. If you'd like to become a patron, you can click the link in the show notes, where you can do so for as little as $3 a month. Now, on with the episode. When someone goes missing, media coverage has the power to help bring them home. But what happens when the media push a suspect too far? This is the Case Remains podcast, episode 20, The Disappearance of Trenton Duckett. Melinda Duckett, as she would come to be known, was born an orphan in South Korea on August the 14th, 1985. She was adopted when she was just four months old by a couple in New York and came over to the USA on Christmas Eve of that same year. As she entered her teenage years, her behaviour started to get out of control and she was eventually sent to live with her grandparents in Florida on her 17th birthday. There, Melinda attended South Sumter High School, where she met a boy named Joshua Duckett. Joshua had a troubled past of his own. He was the son of James Duckett, a former police officer with the Mascot Police Department in Florida. In 1988, when Joshua was just a few years old, His father was sentenced to death, convicted of the rape and murder of an 11-year-old girl who he had picked up while on duty. Joshua and Melinda began dating the same year she started at school, and their relationship was rocky from the start. Nevertheless, they made it through high school together, and in their final year, Melinda discovered that she was pregnant. Trenton Duckett was born on August 10th, 2004, just a couple of months after the couple's high school graduation. They lived together in Bushnell, a city in Sumter County, Florida, where local police attended the home on numerous occasions following arguments between the couple. After their little boy was born, however, things between them only got worse, and soon Trenton got drawn into their battles. The first official record of alleged abuse was made to police in April of 2005, where Joshua said that Melinda threatened to hurt their son if he didn't come home and talk to her, and that she had squeezed Trenton so hard that he had screamed. However, a review made that same day by the Florida Department of Children and Families found that the case didn't meet high-risk criteria and that there was no concern for Trenton's safety. Later that same month, police took Melinda into custody under the Baker Act, an act which allows them to hold someone for a mental evaluation if they're deemed to be a danger to themselves or others. The action was taken following another allegation from Josh that Melinda had been making threats against both herself and Trenton. Talking to the Orlando Sentinel in 2006, Melinda said that she was overwhelmed with the responsibility of having a child and the tempestuous state of her marriage, but that she'd never intended to hurt anyone. She was cleared and out of the facility within 24 hours. In June, Joshua contacted the police again, alleging that this time Melinda had dangled Trenton over water to provoke a reaction from him, and that she'd squeezed the little boy so hard that she'd left marks on his chest. But despite the problems they were having in their relationship, the couple got married just one month later, shortly before Trenton's first birthday. In total... There are five pages worth of incidents recorded by the Department of Children and Families and their involvement with Melinda and Joshua Duckett. However, it's worth noting that only one incident could be verified, one where Melinda had threatened her family with a knife. For many others, the report states that while there were some indicators for possible child neglect, there was little evidence to support child abuse. Before their wedding, Joshua had retracted some of the allegations he'd made towards Melinda, stating that his mother had pressured him into doing so. In the court documents, Joshua stated, I believe that Melinda Duckett loves our son Trenton very much and acts and has acted appropriately towards our son at all times. He would later file a petition for an injunction against his mother, saying that she was harassing him and threatening to take Trenton away. By the end of that year, however, police were once again being called into the midst of one of their fights. 
The couple were arguing in the car park of a mall when Joshua called the authorities, stating that Melinda grabbed Trenton by the neck and threatened to break it. As a result, Trenton was put in foster care for four days while the police investigated the incident. But they again concluded there was no evidence that the little boy had ever come to any physical harm. In June of 2006, Melinda eventually filed for divorce from Joshua in the midst of a contentious legal battle which saw her win sole custody of Trenton. The decision was one that Joshua repeatedly criticised, arguing that he was able to provide a better home for their son than his estranged wife. However, court records show that he didn't complete the requirements that the Department of Children and Families had given him in order for him to do so. A month after she filed for divorce, Melinda was granted a temporary restraining order against Joshua after he'd allegedly sent a message to her threatening to kill both her and Trenton. Now a single mother at the age of 21, Melinda tried to move on with her life. She attended Lake Sumter Community College, where she was taking online classes in criminal psychology. On top of her studies, she was working two jobs, one delivering newspapers and another in sales at a lawn care company. She had talked about going into the police academy or perhaps getting into forensics. Melinda relied heavily on her grandparents, Nancy and Billy, who'd taken her in at the age of 17. Melinda turned to them when things between her and Joshua weren't going well, and they often looked after Trenton while she worked. Melinda and Joshua's chaotic lives were worlds apart from Nancy and Billy's. They had first met at a party when she was 14 and he was 16, and had been married for more than 50 years. They doted on Trenton, and delighted in singing songs, playing and cuddling with their great-grandson. Little did they know, however, all of that was about to change. It was 9.15 in the evening on August 27, 2006, when police received an emergency call from a man telling them that Melinda Duckett's son was missing. He was in the bed sleeping, he said, but when Melinda went in to check on him, he wasn't there. The dispatcher asked to speak to Melinda, and the man is heard calling for her three times. When she reached the phone, she was audibly out of breath. The dispatcher asked her what Trenton was wearing, to which she replied, I don't know, he was ready for bed. He might have had his shoes off, his shirt off. He had a pair of jean shorts. He's only two years old. Melinda told police that she'd just finished watching a movie when she went to check on Trenton in his bedroom. But when she opened the door, she found an empty crib and a 10-inch long cut in the window screen above it. She said that she'd last checked on Trenton before the two-hour-long movie began and before anyone else had arrived in her home. Two men, including the one that had made the 911 call, had been in the apartment at the time Trenton was reported as being abducted from his room. Both said that they'd never seen the little boy while they were there. One of the men, Chris Pierce, passed a polygraph test that was given to him by police. Due to state privacy laws, the man who made the 911 call cannot be identified. With no sign of Trenton at home, an Amber Alert was issued early in the morning on the 28th of August. Melinda told police officers that earlier that day, she and Trenton had driven north to Ocala National Forest, where she had planned to do some target practice at the forest's rifle range. Covering more than 600 square miles, Ocala is known for its large areas of sand pine scrub forest, as well as its numerous springs and rivers. From Melinda's home in Leesburg, it should have taken about an hour to drive to the forest's public shooting range. Once they got to Ocala, however, Melinda said that she couldn't find the range, and so she tried calling friends for help. She proceeded to drive around central Florida for several hours trying to find her way home. At some point, she stopped off at the Altamonte Mall, located in a suburb of Orlando, and changed Trenton's diaper in the parking lot. Eventually, she saw signs for Highway 441, which led her back to her apartment in Leesburg. Her cell phone records matched up to her version of events, 
showing her to be within five miles of an Ocala mall at just past midday on the 27th, and then in various locations around the forest, before pinging near a cell tower in Leesburg at around 10 to 4 in the afternoon. However, a neighbour recalled her returning to her apartment alone. It wasn't the only time she'd been seen alone either. Another witness remembered seeing her at a Leesburg store at 8 that same morning, again with Trenton nowhere to be seen. Police went over the events of the past couple of days with Melinda, trying to pin down the last time Trenton had been seen by anyone but her. The day before, on Saturday the 26th of August, Melinda and Trenton had spent time with her grandparents Nancy and Billy at their home, which they had left around 4.30 in the afternoon. This marked the start of a more than 15-hour period where Melinda's whereabouts were unknown. It also meant that there was more than 24 hours between the time anyone other than Melinda claimed to have seen Trenton and the time that she reported him missing. Police joined forces to try and find the missing boy, with 100 officers and several sniffer dogs from different Florida agencies searching the apartment complex where Melinda and Trenton lived. The FBI were called in to interview Melinda's family and friends. But despite their efforts, no trace of Trenton could be found. On Tuesday the 29th of August, Melinda spoke to reporters, gripping one of Trenton's stuffed toys as she told them about her son. He was well-behaved, friendly and intelligent, she said. He loved chicken nuggets and chasing ducks at the pond. And he was just starting to say his first words, car and ball. He's very outgoing. He can go into a room of people that he doesn't even know and and just, you know, start getting everyone going and everything. Um, He absolutely loves the outdoors, loves, you know, getting out and doing things and, and meeting people, loves playing with kids too. What do you think happened here? Do you think somebody came through that window? Well, I mean, that's the only way that they could have. It was obviously tampered with. Um, I I, I was sitting right out in the living room. Um, There really is no other... (laughs) We've gone over things so many times. Can you walk me through what happened when you went in there, when you went to check on him? Um... It's just the same thing that the police are saying with all of it. So, you just noticed him gone and noticed the window, or? Yes. People who are critical of you who say she doesn't seem to care, she doesn't seem emotional, what do you say to that? <laughs> Actually, kind of, I wish I wasn't sitting here right now. I just hadn't gotten done with all that. Um, gosh. I mean, as a mom, you've got to be going crazy. Can you put into words for people how this has impacted your life? Everything's upside down. But if I don't keep myself together, um, at least during the day, um, keeping in contact with with, uh, the authorities, um, particularly the FBI, answering any questions that I have, participating in absolutely everything that I possibly get my hands on as far as they go, then I'm not doing any good. And I have to be doing something to help with him. Did you have anything to do with that? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> that, I mean, it's... I would be sitting here, um, and, and, and I, I, I have not pointed the finger at anyone whatsoever. Um, and, and even after, because I, I know for a fact we're going to find him, that, um, e- even afterwards, I really don't care about the people involved. I, I don't know him. You just wanted that. Absolutely. With no sign of Trenton, Melinda and Joshua were invited to be interviewed by prosecutor turned TV host Nancy Grace. The filming took place on the 7th of September, with Melinda calling in from her grandparents' home. During the interview, Nancy Grace questioned why Melinda hadn't taken a polygraph test like Joshua had done earlier that week, which Melinda was unable to answer. When questioned on her whereabouts that day that Trenton disappeared, Melinda said that she and Trenton had just been driving around and shopping, but was unable to name any of the specific stores they had been to, saying that she had been told not to do so by her lawyer. By the end of the interview, 
Nancy Grace was banging her fists on the table, asking where she was and what she was doing on the day that Trenton disappeared. Nancy Grace then cut to a psychologist, Dr Lillian Glass, and asked her if there are any weak spots in Melinda's story. Dr Glass answered, This doesn't make any sense to me, and the fact that she's skirting around the issue and can't get to the point concerns me a lot. Her reaction is not the typical reaction of a mother who has a missing child, whose child was taken from the bed when she says, I don't cry my eyes out. Most people would be emotional about it, and the fact that she's been skirting the issue through this entire interview concerns me. The following day, a few hours before the show was due to be aired, Melinda Duckett took her grandfather's shotgun, shut herself in a closet, and pulled the trigger. Before committing suicide, Melinda had handwritten three notes, which she had left on the dashboard of her car. One was addressed to her grandparents, the second to her parents, and the third to the public. The letter to the public detailed the anger she had felt being faced with ridicule and criticism, as she put it, about her role in Trenton's disappearance, made worse by her appearance on Nancy Grace. Your focus came off my son, she said. I love him and only wanted him safe in my arms. You created rumours and twisted words. This is a last minute idea, but I felt myself sinking after the one week mark of Trenton being gone. The letter did, however, make reference to Trenton possibly still being alive. He was and always will be my essence, it read, and as he grows, I want him to know that. Melinda's family were quick to blame her appearance on Nancy Grace as a contributing factor in her suicide, an accusation which both Nancy Grace and CNN denied. But to suggest a 15 to 20 minute interview caused someone to commit suicide, I feel is focusing on the wrong thing. Why do you think it happened? It should be focused. Why do you think it happened, Nancy Grace? After the interview, within 24 hours, it was a very difficult interview. There was a lot of stress. Do you feel any responsibility? I think it happened because Melinda Duckett may very well know where her son was. She even told her mother just before she killed herself, Trenton's not coming home, Mom. He's not coming home. How, Chris, would she have known that? If anything, I would suggest guilt caused her to commit suicide. And while I sympathize with her family and know as a firsthand victim of crime myself, you look for somebody to blame, anybody. And today the family is blaming me. And um, I hate what they're going through. But I would suggest their efforts go toward finding this baby. The idea of a journalist, an interviewer, and then being a judge or a jury, do you believe that that line has become a little bit blurred? That when you go after someone in an interview, maybe you're taking on a job that's not the job to have? Sir, I did not go after Melinda Duckett. Correction. Melinda Duckett refused to answer questions to either myself or police about her child's whereabouts. It is highly likely he is dead now because of that. Three months later, Melinda's family filed a wrongful death lawsuit against Nancy Grace and CNN. The complaint stated that the show had persuaded Melinda to be interviewed by telling her that her appearance might help Trenton to be found, all the while knowing that they intended to surprise Melinda with accusations, questions and verbal assaults, clearly intending to intimate that she had murdered her child. They also accused the network of airing the show just hours after Melinda's suicide in order to boost their ratings and without the permission of Melinda's family. The complaint requested a jury trial and for the court to award judgment in excess of $15,000 plus punitive damages. There was also another defendant named on the complaint, Joshua Duckett. However, he was eventually dropped from the suit when a judge ruled that Melinda's family couldn't establish a claim against him. In an attempt to get the lawsuit dismissed, CNN and Nancy Grace's legal team argued that Melinda had in fact scripted her own performance on the show. A document on Melinda's computer revealed that she had listed talking points for her appearance on Nancy Grace, including a summary of events on the night that Trenton disappeared. They also argued that the suit would severely chill media coverage on missing persons cases. 
but despite their best efforts, US District Judge William Terrell Hodges denied their motion. The lawsuit was to go ahead. With Melinda dead, new and unsettling details regarding Trenton's disappearance were made public. Police revealed that in a search of Melinda's apartment just days after he vanished, they discovered some of his toys, photographs and a sonogram photo in the bin. Another witness had come forward, an employee at Wendy's drive through who claimed to have seen Melinda twice at the drive through on the day that Trenton disappeared. The first time, Trenton was in the car, but the second time, just 30 minutes later, Melinda was alone. Police had also discovered that the threatening MySpace message that Melinda had supposedly received from Joshua had actually been sent by herself after hacking into his account. It was the same message that was the grounds for the restraining order that Melinda had petitioned for in June that had severely limited Joshua's contact with his son. Police believed that Melinda had sent the fake message to support her claim, that Trenton may have been snatched by his very own father. During the investigation, the FBI had profiled Melinda, concluding that she was highly organised and driven to achieve, but with an ability to manipulate others to do her bidding. The report stated that she engaged in what's called impression management, depicting herself as a loving mother and a vulnerable victim. She always felt she had to be in control, it read, and would become emotionally unstable when she perceived the actions of others to be attacks against her. With that in mind, Belinda's appearance on The Nancy Grace Show was a huge risk, opening herself up not only to the criticism of Nancy Grace, but to the millions of Americans who would be tuning in at home. As the FBI wrote in their report, it was the ultimate win-or-lose proposition. Being aware of Melinda's psychological profile, the Leesburg police had deliberately held off on taking any course of action that might expose any kind of wrongdoing, such as delaying her arrest on the fake message that she'd sent from Joshua's MySpace account. They had hoped that by doing so, Melinda would eventually bring her guard down and tell them what had happened to Trenton. In fact, they revealed that not only was Melinda their prime suspect, but that they had enough evidence to arrest her within four days of Trenton's disappearance. With their prime suspect now dead, police looked back at Melinda's last known whereabouts to try and find the missing boy. Divers spent days searching the bottom of Falls Lake and Ocala National Forest, while investigators and dogs searched the ground. Plans to enlist alligator trappers were held off at the request of the sheriff, whereby all alligators large enough to eat a toddler would be trapped and cut open to look for remains. But sadly, the authorities came back empty-handed. The police continued to receive tips, taking their investigation to Texas, New York, Ohio, and even to South Korea. But as the weeks turned into months with no news, police admitted that they hadn't had a solid investigative lead since the day Melinda died. There wasn't even any significant evidence to point to the little boy being alive or dead. As Trenton Duckett's name slowly disappeared from the papers, the lawsuit against Nancy Grace and CNN was well underway. Finally, after four years of litigation, the parties had come to the conclusion that CNN and Nancy Grace engaged in no intentional wrongdoing in the filming of the show. As part of the settlement, CNN were ordered to contribute $200,000 to a trust fund dedicated to finding Trenton. If he was found alive before his 13th birthday, the remainder of the fund would be given to him. If not, the money would be donated to the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children. It may have marked the end of their legal battle, but for Melinda's family, the pain and uncertainty lived on. Dealt the blow of not one family tragedy, but two. Through lies, accusations and a media frenzy, at the heart of this case, there's a missing young boy. It's now been 13 years since he disappeared, but Trenton Duckett hasn't been forgotten. In August of this year, just like each one before it, 
a candlelit vigil was held outside Leesburg City Hall. About 30 people gathered together, connected by a glimmer of hope that Trenton Duckett might one day come home. Thank you for listening to episode 20 of the Case Remains podcast, which marks the last episode of series one. I'll be taking a bit of time off to work on an exciting new project before we return with series two on November 24th. And if you are already a Patreon supporter, I'll be freezing payments for the next month, so you won't be charged while the show's on a break. And of course, if you'd like to keep in touch in the meantime, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram with the handle Case Remains, or you can go to www.caseremains.com, where you'll find write-ups on missing person cases and unsolved mysteries. Before I sign off today's episode, I'd like to introduce you to another true crime podcast I've been enjoying, Apple for the Teacher. Hello everyone, let me tell you about the Apple for the Teacher podcast. I'm Anna Thomas, a teacher and your host. So you're probably thinking it's about reading, writing and arithmetic, right? Well, think again. It's a fresh take on true crime, where you wouldn't expect to find true crime in schools. Yes, schools. You will hear tragic and shocking stories that I have uncovered in my own profession. You'll hear about murder, abduction, hijack, misconduct, student disappearance, suicide, kidnap and ransom, and much, much more. So if you're looking for something a little different in the true crime genre, an apple for the teacher is for you. You can find the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you download your podcasts. So join me as I present People Behaving Badly, The Bad Apples. Looking forward to seeing you soon. But until then, remember to be a good apple. So that's all for Series 1 of the Case Remains podcast. I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone who has listened, reviewed and rated so far. And I can't wait to bring you more unsolved cases when we return in November. Until next time, stay safe. 